Hello students, welcome to the lecture on partnership accounts and after the lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the asset contributions to partnerships, explain the characteristics of partnerships business, discuss to the adjustments after closing the accounts, describe the fixed and fluctuating capital accounts, explain the goodwill account, define the joint life policy. Let's start with an introduction to partnership accounting. In partnership accounting, in which we will examine partners' accounts in the accounting records, the distribution of periodic net income and the admission of new and the retirement of existing partners and the liquidation of the partnership. A business partnership is a relationship between two or more persons who are in business together with a view to making a profit. Those persons may be individuals, companies or possibly even trusts. The existence of a partnership is a question of fact. There does not have to be a written partnership agreement, but it is preferable to formalize the relationship between the partners in a written agreement to avoid further disputes, which sadly are well all too common with partnerships. However, tax on partnership profits is not a joint liability of the partnership. Instead, each partner is taxed individually on their share of profits and is liable only for the tax and national insurance on that share. The net income or loss is added to the capital accounts in the closing process. The withdrawal account is also closed to the capital account in the closing process. Moving on to the next topic, let's now study asset contributions to partnerships. When a partnership is formed or a partner is added and contributes assets other than cash, the partnership establishes the net realizable or fair market value for the assets. Income allocations. The partnership agreement should include how the net income or loss will be allocated to the partners. If the agreement is silent, the net income or loss is allocated equally to all partners. As partners are the owners of the business, they do not receive a salary, but each has the right to withdraw assets up to the level of his or her capital account balance. Some partnership agreements refer to salaries or salary allowances for partners and interest on investments. These are not expenses of the business, they are part of the formula for splitting net income. Many partners use the components of the formula for splitting net income or loss to determine how much they will withdraw in cash from the business during the year, in anticipation of their share of net income. If the partnership uses the accurate basis of accounting, the partners pay federal income taxes on their share of net income, regardless of how much cash they will actually withdraw from the partnership during the year. Partners' Accounts once net income is allocated to the partner, it is transferred to the individual's partner's capital accounts through closing entries. Students, we shall now discuss the characteristics of partnerships business. In a contract of partnership, two or more persons bind themselves to contribute money, property or industry to a common fund with the intention of dividing the profit among themselves. Two or more persons may also form a partnership for the exercise of a profession and association of two or more persons to carry on as co-owners a business for profit. Partnerships resemble sole proprietorships except that there are two or more owners of the business. Each owner is called a partner. Partnerships are often formed to bring together various talents and knowledge or to bring needed capital into a business. Partnerships are generally associated with the practice of law, public accounting, medicine and other professions. Partnership of this nature are called general professional partnerships. On the other hand, service industries, retail trade, wholesale and manufacturing enterprises may also be organized as partnerships. Characteristics of partnerships The characteristics of partnerships are different from the sole proprietorships already studied in basic accounting. Some of the more important characteristics are mutual contribution. There cannot be a partnership without contribution of money, property or industry, that is work or services, which may either be personal manual efforts or intellectual to a common fund. Division of profits or losses. The essence of partnership is that each partner must share in the profits or losses of the venture. Co-ownership of contributed assets. All assets contributed into the partnership are owned by the partnership by virtue of its separate and distinct juridical personality. If one partner contributes an asset to the business, all partners jointly own it in a special sense. Mutual agency. Any partner can bind the other partners to a contract if he is acting within his express or implied authority. Limited life. 
A partnership has a limited life. It may be dissolved by the admission, death, insolvency and incapacity, withdrawal of a partner or expiration of the terms specified in the partnership agreement. Unlimited liability. All partners except limited partners, including industrial partners, are personally liable for all debts incurred by the partnership. If the partnership cannot settle its obligations, creditors' claim will be satisfied from the personal assets of the partners without prejudice to the rights of the separate creditor of the partners. Income taxes. Partnerships, except general professional partnerships, are subject to tax at the rate of 34% in 1998, 33 in 1999 and 32% in 2000 and thereafter of taxable income. Partners equity accounts. Accounting for partnerships is much like accounting for sole proprietorships. The difference lies in the number of partners equity accounts. Each partner has a capital account and a withdrawal account that serves similar functions as the related accounts for sole proprietorships. Kinds of partnership. According to object, universal partnership of all present property. All contributions become part of the partnership fund. Universal partnerships of profits. All that the partners may acquire by their industry or work during the existence of the partnership and the use of whatever the partners contributed at the time of the institution of the contract belong to the partnership. Particular partnership. The object of the partnership is determine its use or fruit, specific undertaking or the exercise of a profession or vocation. According to liability, general, all partners are liable to the extent of the separate properties. Limited. The limited partners are liable only to the extent of their personal contributions. In a limited partnership, the law states that there shall be at least one general partner. According to duration, partnership with a fixed term or for a particular undertaking. Partnership at will, one in which no term is specified and is not formed before any particular undertaking. According to purpose, commercial or trading partnership, one formed from the transaction of business, professional or non-trading partnership one formed for the exercise of profession according to legality of existence de jure partnership one which has complied with all the legal requirements for its establishment de facto partnership one which has failed to comply with all the legal requirements for its establishment partnership deed partnership is formed by an agreement the agreement may be verbal or in writing or may be inferred from the conduct of the partners to avoid future disputes and differences between the partners, it is desirable to have a written agreement. The written agreement between or among the partners is known as partnership deed, otherwise known as articles of partnership. My name is Keith Hall. I'm a CPA and I work exclusively with small business owners just like you. Uh, one of the big questions you have to address in operating your small businesses uh, are how are you going to operate as a corporation, partnership, LLC, sole proprietorship. So let's talk a minute about operating as a partnership. Uh, what are the benefits? What are the detriments? Uh, a partnership is relatively easy to, to organize. Uh, doesn't have a lot of filing fees with your state. Uh, by definition, a partnership is at least two people. Uh, as a general rule, there are two types of partnerships. There's a general partnership and then limited liability partnerships. Uh, the general partners are, are the most common form. Uh, if you just have a friend or a coworker, uh, someone that you form the business together because y'all have a joint idea, most likely you're going to be general partners. And what that means basically is all of the liabilities of that partnership are also going to be liabilities of yours uh, personally. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if you are going to form a limited partnership, uh, that basically allows you to raise money uh, from other people who aren't going to actually participate in the management. Uh, those individuals are only going to be subject uh, from a liability standpoint to their ultimate investment. Uh, if the partnership borrows money or loses money or perhaps there's even some other liability issue that arises, a limited partner is not going to be subject to those additional liabilities. They can only lose their investment, I guess. As a general partner, you uh, and the other individual that you formed the organization together, you're going to be liable for all of those type of things. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, one of the detriments of being a general partner, if you are going to actually invest in a partnership as opposed to just organizing your small business, make sure you look at the documentation to know whether you're going to be a general partner or a limited partner. That's a key issue in managing that partnership. 
Uh, one of the benefits of a partnership is at the same time you can allocate earnings or losses as you see fit amongst your partners. Uh, so if you've got a particular year where one of you has contributed more to the earnings of the entity than perhaps the other one, you can allocate those interests as you see fit. A little bit of a flexibility issue there. Uh, one of the detriments from the partnership standpoint is you're going to have to file another tax return for that new entity. The partnership is going to file an IRS Form 1065. That's a U.S. partnership tax return. Uh, lots of information on those, relatively straightforward. You can download a copy of that form right here at mahalo.com. You can also go to irs.gov and find those forms as well. Now that partnership return is going to generate a form K-1 for each of the owners. Now that K-1 is what you're going to use to complete your own tax return. So a little bit of a detriment from a, a complexity standpoint as well as a cost standpoint because operating that form of business is going to make you file that extra tax return. Uh, also, the liability issue tends to be a detriment from that partnership form of organization because as a general partner, and remember a partnership is always going to have to have at least one general partner, and if it's your organization, you're probably going to be the general partner. Uh, uh, you're going to ultimately be responsible for all of those liabilities. So if you're in an, inter, uh, an industry that has somewhat higher than normal liabilities, keep that in mind. Uh, also consider some type of insurance policy, a general umbrella liability policy. That might help the partnership and you personally protect some of your assets for some of those uh, unexpected liabilities. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a couple of good uh, uh, benefits of a partnership form of organization and a couple of the uh, downside, the little extra costs for operating as a partnership. Adjustments after closing the accounts. Adjusting entries are made at the end of the accounting period, but prior to preparing the financial statements, in order for a company's accounting records and financial statements to be up to date on the accurate basis of accounting. For example, each day the company incurs wages expense but the payroll involving workers' wages for the last day of the month will not be entered in the accounting records until after the accounting period ends. Similarly, the company uses electricity each day but receives only one bill per month, perhaps on the 20th day of the month. The electricity expense for the last 10-15 days of the month must get into the accounting records if the financial statements are to show all of the expenses and the amounts owed for the current accounting period. Other adjusting entries involve amounts that the company paid prior to the amounts becoming expenses. Closing entries are dated as of the last day of the accounting period, but they are entered into the accounts after the financial statements are prepared. For the most part, closing entries involve the income statement accounts. The closing entries set the balances of all of the revenue accounts and the expense accounts to zero. This means that the revenue and expense accounts will start the new year with nothing in the accounts, allowing the company to easily report the new year revenues and expenses. The net amount of all of the balances from the revenue and expense accounts at the end of the year will end up in retained earnings for corporations or owners' equity for sole proprietorships. Let's study the fixed and fluctuating capital accounts. Fixed and fluctuating capital accounts are the terms which are often used in the context of partnership. Partners can maintain the capital accounts in two ways. One is fixed capital account and the other is fluctuating capital accounts. Fixed capital account. Under this system, the capital which is introduced by partners will remain fixed throughout the life of the partnership. Hence, under this method, two types of accounts are made. One is capital account and the other is current account. In a fluctuating capital account, in this account, capital account of partners will not remain fixed Rather, they will keep fluctuating from time to time. In this method, all the entries that are related to drawings, interest on capital and share of profit and loss of partners are recorded in capital account. Hence, in this method, there is no need for current account. Fluctuating capital account method is usually preferred by partners. However, they can also use fixed capital account according to their business and preference. Difference between fixed capital and fluctuating capital methods. The transactions in partnership firms are recorded in the partners' respective capital accounts. The two methods of maintaining capital accounts of partners are fixed capital method and the fluctuating capital method. Under fixed capital method, there are two separate accounts prepared for each partner, the capital account and the current account. 
In the capital account, the balance of capital remains the same for all the years unless any additional capital is introduced or withdrawn by the partners. In the current account, all the other transactions like drawing, interest on capital and interest on drawings, share of profit or loss and salary are recorded and the balance of the current account keeps changing whenever the transactions take place. Let's now discuss goodwill account. Goodwill is also one of the special aspects of partnership accounts which require adjustment at the time of a change in the profit sharing ratio. The admission of a partner or the retirement or death of a partner. Meaning of goodwill. Over a period of time a well established business develops an advantage of good name, reputation and wide business connections. This helps the business to earn more profits as compared to a newly set up business. In accounting, the monetary value of such advantage is known as goodwill. It is regarded as an intangible asset. In other words, goodwill is the value of the reputation of a firm in respect of the profits expected in future over and above the normal profits. It is generally observed that when a person pays for goodwill, he or she pays for something which places him in the position of being able to earn super profits as compared to the profit earned by other firms in the same industry. In simple words, goodwill can be defined as the present value of a firm's anticipated excess earnings or as the capitalized value attached to the differential profit capacity of a business. Thus, goodwill exists only when the firm earns super profits. Any firm that earns normal profits or is incurring losses has no goodwill. Factors giving rise to goodwill. The main factors helping the creation of goodwill are nature of business. A firm that produces high value added products or having a stable demand is able to earn more profits and therefore has more goodwill. Location. If the business is centrally located or is at a good place having heavy customer traffic, the goodwill tends to be high. Efficiency of management. A well-managed concern usually enjoys the advantage of high productivity and cost efficiency. This leads to higher profits and so the value of goodwill will also be high. Market situation. The monopoly condition or limited competition enables the concern to earn high profits which leads to higher value of goodwill. Special advantages. The firm that enjoys special advantages like import licenses, low rate and assured supply of electricity, long-term contracts or for supply of materials, well-known collaborators, patents, trademark etc. enjoy higher value of goodwill. Need for valuation. Normally, the need for valuation of goodwill arises at the time of the sale of a business. But in case of a partnership firm, it may also arise in the following circumstances. Change in the profit sharing ratio amongst the existing partners. Admission of a new partner. Retirement of a partner and death of a partner. Dissolution of a firm which involves sale of business as a going concern and amalgamation of firms. Did you know to calculate goodwill, the purchase price is deducted from the fair market value of identifiable assets and liabilities of the company acquired. In this video, we're going to talk about something called goodwill. Uh, goodwill is something that's a little hard for some people to understand. Uh, technically, it's something that's recognized when one business purchases another business. So when you acquire another business and, and the purchase price, the amount paid for that other business exceeds the fair value of the net identifiable assets of that business. So that sounds a little complex. Let's just work through an example and I think it'll, it'll become a lot more clear. So in our example, let's say the target the company that we're, we're trying to acquire. We're a company, we're trying to acquire this new company called Target Company. So we're going to have to look at Target Company's assets and liabilities in order to figure out what its net identifiable assets are. So let's say in terms of assets, this company has cash of, of $25, they have accounts receivable uh, of $50, they have inventory, $50 and PP&E of $100. Now, now these are all assets, but we need net identifiable assets. And these, these are all fair values. We're assuming this is all a fair value. But we need to know the net. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to have to subtract out liabilities. So let's say that there are liabilities of 75 
So the, the, these are some debts or something that the company has. So we're going to have to net this, subtract these liabilities from the fair value of the assets. And what that's going to yield is that's going to yield net assets of 150. So you might be thinking, well, what, why is this important? Well, now we need to know what is our purchase price. Because we're going to compare our purchase price to the, the, this fair value of the net identifiable assets. We're going to compare this to this. So let's say the purchase price that we end up paying uh, $400 for Target Company. That's, that's what we pay to buy Target Company. So now what we do is we take the purchase price of 400 and we subtract out this 150. So this is the, the value of the net assets, and this is what we pay. So we're just taking what we pay, subtracting the net assets, and then the balance, this is 250. And that 250 is goodwill. Now, well, what theoretically is this goodwill? Well, I guess you could say that it, it represents uh, kind of a premium that we're paying for these assets. Now, why would we pay more? If this, if we know the fair value, or we're estimating the fair value, and, and ultimately this is what we think that the net assets are worth of this company, why would we pay $400? Well, it could be uh, that there's some kind of uh, synergy uh, maybe we believe that these assets will, once they're with our company in conjunction with our assets and our resources, maybe in our hands they're worth a lot more than 150. Uh, you know, maybe we just feel that these assets, uh, when in conjunction with one another, uh, the value is actually a lot greater than the the individual sum of the parts. So there's many reasons why we we might. Uh, do what it looks like we're overpaying here of $250, and maybe we are. Uh, but in any event, we're going to recognize this extra, this premium, as a good goodwill. So he, there's a few things that we should note about goodwill. So so here's some here's some caveats. So number one, goodwill never internally generated. Okay, we only get this when we're purchasing another company. We can't say, oh, well, we, we, we think that we actually, uh, we, we've got a lot of synergies here that, you know, we, we really built up a good company. And no, it, it doesn't work like that. You don't internally generate goodwill. It only comes from an acquisition. So another caveat is that we do not amortize goodwill. It is not amortized like some other types of intangible assets. Uh, Goodwill is an intangible asset, but some, some assets that are intangible, we go ahead and amortize them over time. Goodwill is never amortized. However, goodwill can, in certain circumstances, it can be impaired. So sometimes you'll hear that after uh, following an acquisition, maybe a year or two down the road, uh, you'll hear of a firm saying, oh, we took this this really big charge or this really big impairment uh, related to goodwill. Joint life policy. A life insurance policy obtained jointly on the lives of the members of a partnership firm is called a joint life policy. Since the firm has an insurable interest in the lives of its members, hence to make finances available for payment to the retiring partner on his retirement or to the legal heirs of the deceased partner, it obtains a joint life policy. The payment for the policy may be either privately by the partners or by the firm. The joint life policy matures on the death of any one of the partners or on the expiry of the time for which it is obtained. Maturity of the policy means that the insurance company becomes liable to pay the sum assured to the firm either on the death of a partner or on the expiry of the time whichever happens earlier. Accounting treatment. The premium on the joint life policy may be paid either privately by the partners or by the firm. When the premium is paid privately by the partners, then no accounting treatment is required in the books of the firm. 
But when the premium is paid out of the firm's cash, then the transactions relating to joint life policy will have to be shown in the books of the firm. The treatment of joint life policy of the firm will depend upon the fact whether the premium paid has been considered as revenue expenditure or capital expenditure. When premium paid is considered by the firm as a revenue expenditure, then it opens an account called joint life policy premium account. Premium paid annually is debited to this account and credited to cash account. At the end of the year, the premium paid is transferred to joint life policy account. These two entries of payment of premium and its writing off to its profit and loss account are recorded every year. On maturity of the policy, amount received from the insurance company is credited to the capital accounts of all the partners including the retired or the deceased partner in their profit sharing ratio. Premium paid is debited to this account and credited to bank account. At the end of the year, the joint life policy premium account is reduced to surrender value by debiting the difference between the premium paid and surrender value. Now, in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. A business partnership is a relationship between two or more persons who are in business together with a view to making a profit. Partnerships resemble sole proprietorships except that there are two or more owners of the business. A cooperation has the capacity of continued existence regardless of the death, withdrawal, insolvency or incapacity of its directors or stockholders. Partnerships of this nature are called general professional partnerships. Goodwill is also one of the special aspects of partnership accounts which require adjustment at the time of a change in the profit sharing ratio, the admission of a partner or the retirement or death of a partner.